normally when I preach from the Bible, I like to read the entire biblical text. Have you noticed that Psalm 119 has 176 verses? So I, I did weigh the possibility of just reading the psalm and sitting down. I mean, there, there's something to be said for that. At one of the conferences that some of us ran on world mission a few years ago, uh, one of the speakers got up when it was his turn, and he said, um, the book of Romans is in some ways a missionary prayer letter. Paul's writing to the Romans to tell the Romans that he's on his way to Spain to preach the gospel, and he wants their help. So in the course of writing this letter for help, he, he begins by saying, this is the gospel that I preach. So what is it that Paul says in his missionary prayer letter. He says, well, this is what he says. And he recited Romans 1 to 8 with, without looking at the text, just recited Romans 1 to 8. And some of it was really quite dramatic. There is therefore now no condemnation to those. 4,000 people stood up and cheered. Yeah. You see, the Word of God has a certain kind of constraining power just on its own. So I really did seriously consider the possibility of simply reciting Psalm 119 and sitting down. It would have been very interesting to find out what the question and answer period would have been like, you know? <laughs> um, how much thought did you give to that message? <laughs> so what I'm going to do instead is read three of the 22 units. It's broken up into 22 units, each unit eight verses long. I'm going to read the first, the fifth, and the sixth, and then we'll set out to find out what the whole chapter is about. So hear the Word of God, Psalm 119, beginning at verse 1. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His statutes and seek Him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow His ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Verse 33, section 5. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servants so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, preserve my life. May your unfailing love come to me, Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then I can answer anyone who taunts me, for I trust in your word. Never take your word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. I will always obey your law forever and ever. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. I will speak of your statutes before kings and will not be put to shame, for I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. This is the word of the Lord. So the longest chapter in the whole Bible is about the Bible. <laughs> to put it rather differently, thoughtful Christians across the centuries have often said that genuine, vital Christian faith turns on two principles, a formal principle and a material principle. The formal principle, that is, that principle on which we base everything else is the truthfulness and reliability of God's most holy word. 
the material principle, that is the substance of what's in the Word, is the gospel. And you need both. For example, there are some groups like Jehovah's Witnesses who have as strong a formal principle as I do. They believe that the Bible is the Word of God, that it's given by inspiration, that it's inerrant, that it's truthful, that it's reliable, but they don't understand the gospel. They interpret it so bizarrely that at the end of the day, they have the formal principle, but they don't agree at all on the material principle. And it's possible to have a material principle, that is to have a good grasp of the gospel that's been passed on to you by some means or other, where you've left the authority of the Word of God behind. What always happens, it's only a matter of time, is that gospel that you espouse is no longer being corrected by the formal principle and you gradually drift off into some weird cult or something that's bizarre. What you really need is the formal principle, the Word of God, and the material principle, a full grasp of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's not too surprising to find passages like this to Joshua as he takes up the reins of leadership in succession to Moses. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. Then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. Or Psalm 1-2, what is a righteous person like? They're like, they're like a tree planted by streams of water, verse 3. And verse 2, positively, they, they meditate on the Word of God day and night. That's what they think about. I, I've been teaching at Trinity for almost 40 years. When I arrived, there was an old man there who taught homiletics how to preach. And he had a lot of these one-liners. He picked them up over the years. And some of them were brilliant. One of them was, you're not what you think you are, but what you think you are. Uh, some fall on stony ground. They, they, they take a while to sink into the soil. You, it, it, he, the, the, the point is that um, he's really adapting a, a lesson from Proverbs. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You're not just what you say, you're not just what you do, because you can hide with hypocrisy behind what you say and what you do. But as you think in, you, in your heart, that's what you really are. So supposing you meditate on the Word of God day and night. Now, this psalm is not an exposition of how inspiration takes place. It's not a history of how the Word of God came to us. It's not a, an apologetic to defend the truthfulness of the Word of God. It's none of those things. The Bible is an amazing book, but this psalm does not tell us the things I'm going to mention. It was written over about 1,500 years in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek through multiple human authors with their own vocabulary and style and so on. And yet, ultimately, by one author, it is nothing less than God's own words. Even how to think about that takes some doing. And not only so, it has multiple genres. If you read the Quran, for example, it's got one dominant genre. God speaks directly to the people who read it, and most of it is in terms of commands. But the Bible has uh, stories, history. It has uh, genealogies, laws, statutes. It has proverbs. It has parables. It has letters. It has apocalyptic literature. It even has some jokes. There's Jotham's fable that you can read, too, in Judges. It, 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 this is an amazing book of diversity. It has disquisitions, it's got, uh, it's got uh, lament, uh, it has songs and poetry, and all of it feeding together to make one giant story that can be summed up as God's self-disclosure to us. 
Psalm 119 doesn't make, mention any of those details. Moreover, it is full of things that we're dealing with in the wraparound course. It's dealing with things that, that you have to understand to understand the Bible, things that our culture isn't interested in anymore. It talks about covenant. How many people in the streets of this city are really interested in divine covenants? Temple, blood sacrifice, priest, consummation, kings. This is a republic for goodness sake. The last king that we had didn't fare too well. We got rid of him 240 years ago. But, but the Bible is full of kings and one particular king. And, and, and then this God in the person of His Son joins the human race as part of a Davidic kingly line. And when he begins to preach, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. Kingdom? It doesn't even say republic. <laughs> He's not even a constitutional monarch like Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, you know. He reigns. And none of these categories is, is common in our culture. And yet, and yet, they dominate Scripture. At the end of the day, you can't understand Scripture unless you come to understand some of those themes. Part of the teacher's job, the preacher's job, is to take people from where they are now to understanding in biblical terms what's going on in the Bible and then swinging it back to figuring out how that applies to our lives. Do you, do you see? It's another culture, a set of different cultures. So what is this psalm about then? This longest chapter in the Bible is essentially given over to meditating on the Word of God and its delights. It's not a linear projection. It's not a, an exposition of something. It's, it's a meditation. It goes back and recycles the same handful of thoughts again and again and again and again. So, what I'm going to do is outline in five points something of the structure of this thing, what we're supposed to learn from it in a big picture, and then look slightly more closely at two of its sections, and then a couple of applications at the end, and we're done. So, first of all, the structure of the whole, five points. Number one, it's an acrostic poem. We don't write poetry like that today, but it's an acrostic poem. The Hebrew alphabet, this was written in Hebrew, has 22 letters, unlike 26 in English. A lot of languages have more or fewer. Some languages have 33 or 37. Hebrew has 22 letters. And in each section, every new verse begins with the, the letter of that section. So some of your Bibles will have in before chapter 22, uh, chapter 119, verse 1, Aleph. That's the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The next one is Beit, then Gimel, then Daleth, then He, Vav, Zion, and so on, all the way through the Hebrew alphabet. And for the next eight verses in each case, every verse begins with a word that begins with that letter. So it's a way of saying this is an alphabet full of the Bible. It's an alphabet full of the glory of the revelation of God. This isn't the only acrostic poem in the Bible, um, just for your interest's sake. Psalms 9 and 10 taken together constitute one acrostic poem, but one verse for each letter, but not as here in Psalm 119, eight verses for each letter. A lot of acrostic poems are one verse, one stanza for each letter. It happens just once. In this psalm, each letter is introduced eight times. So there are 22 sections, and each is eight verses long, and that's what gives us 176 verses, do you see? Or Psalm 25 is an acrostic poem, so is Psalm 111 and half a dozen others. And Proverbs 31 on the ideal woman, Proverbs 31, 10, and so on, that's written as an acrostic poem. Occasionally, the particular letter helps shape the content. So a few moments ago, I read verses 33 to 40. Did you notice that almost every line begins with a command, an imperative in prayer to God? Teach me, Lord. Give me understanding. Direct me in the path of your commands. Turn my heart. Turn my eyes. Fulfill your promise. Do you, do you see? That's because the letter 
He in Hebrew is connected structurally to command. And the next section, wow, or vav, as it's pronounced in modern Hebrew, um, means roughly and. What you have is a kind of sequencing of thoughts. There are no commands here at all. May your unfailing love come to me and your salvation according to your promise. I will always obey your law forever and ever. I will walk about in freedom, and I will do this, and I will do that, and I will do that, and I will do that. It's a different tone, do you see? So sometimes the tones are set just by the Hebrew letter, which you're not going to understand unless somebody who knows a bit of Hebrew tells you. The translations are good, but you might not see the reason why it's put that way. So it's an acrostic poem. That's the easiest observation. Second, it uses eight synonyms for scripture, such words as law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, and so on. I'll come to them in a moment. It uses eight words. And these are not words that are hermetically sealed off with some narrow meaning that none of the others touches. They, they overlap. But it's worth pausing for a moment to think about the words that are used because all of them together are meant to shape our understanding of what scripture is. See, the word scripture itself simply means something written. The word Bible simply means book. And it's worth understanding what law means and so on to see how these words are used to describe holy scripture. So I'm going to refer to the first place that each of these eight words is used in Psalm 119. I won't go through all of the uses. It would take too long. But first, law. 119.1, blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Now, when we hear the word law in English, we tend to think of a demand made by the state, passed by some legislative body, signed into law by a president or a monarch. It's, it's a demand, a prohibition, a, com a command. But the word law, Torah in Hebrew, is broader than that. It can refer to legal material, law as demand, but it can refer to instruction. And indeed, the verbal form of the law is often used in the Bible for, uh, the me with the meaning teach. For example, in verse 33, teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees. It's the verbal root for law. And in the Bible, the word law sometimes refers to instruction from God that is not cast as legal demand. So all the Old Testament canon, the whole thing, can be referred to on occasion as the law of the Lord, Scripture, in other words. And sometimes the word law is used just for the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Sometimes that's the law of the Lord, so that Jews could talk of the law of the Lord, the Psalms, and the prophets. It's another way of talking about the whole Old Testament, but sometimes use the law of the Lord for the whole thing. And it's not just then demand, but the stories, and the Psalms, and the Proverbs, and all of it together is God's instruction about what we should think about Him and about sin and about ourselves and the promises of God and the Redeemer who's coming and, and the Lord Jesus who is still on His way in Old Testament times, do you see? All of that is law. And it is one of the dominant words in this chapter. Number two, testimonies. Now, some modern English translations don't use the word. They sometimes render it as statutes. So, verse 2, blessed are those who keep His statutes, His testimonies. The idea is that God has given testimony concerning Himself by His revelation. He has borne witness to Himself by His revelation. So that we're told, for example, in, um, in Deuteronomy 21, 26, that the book of the law is to be placed next to the Ark of the Covenant that it will remain as a testimony against you. It's, it's God's Word that is bearing witness to God and testifying against us if we don't do what we're told. And some translations, like the NIV that I'm using, render that customarily by statutes. Number three, precepts, verse four. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. That is, particular instructions that have mandatory power. They're to be fully obeyed obeyed. And then another word that is sometimes rendered statutes, uh, now in the sense of decrees, 
Verse 5, oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. That is, judicial judgments that God has decided upon and enacted legally, his pronouncements of things, um, that's uh, these statutes. Precepts, statutes. Then a word for commands, verse 6. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. And it means very much what we think commands means in English. Then... Number six, ordinances, or sometimes decrees in translation. Verse eight, I will obey your decrees. I will obey your ordinances, your judgments, the, the decisions of the perfect judge. Then the word that is most commonly, widely used for Scripture in the Old Testament, verse nine, the word, word. How can a young person stay on the path of purity but living according to your word? That is, God is a talking God. So sometimes the word word is used for God's revelation seen globally. The word of the Lord came to the prophet Isaiah saying. But sometimes it's used in the plural. These are all the words of the Lord in a particular context. In other words, the word of the Lord extends all the way down to the individual words. In the New Testament, the word of God sometimes refers to the Old Testament, and sometimes it refers to the gospel itself, the supreme manifestation of the Word of God, the revelation of God. Everything depends on context. And finally, promise, as in, for example, 111. I have hidden your word. It's literally here, your promise. It's another word for word. I have hidden your promise in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, there are other ways of talking about God's self-disclosure in this psalm. Look at verse 3, ways. They do no wrong but follow His ways. Or in verse 132, the name of the Lord is critical. Turn to me and have mercy on me as you always do to those who love your name. Or in verse 90, your faithfulness continues through all generations. So ways and faithfulness, the name of the Lord, these are all ways of talking about God's revelation. That's what we're talking about when we read Psalm 119. Now, if you're here and you're perhaps brought along by a Christian friend and none of this seems uh, particularly relevant to your life right now, uh, pause and think about it for a moment. We're talking about God's self-disclosure in words and promises and decrees and commandments and instruction and precepts. And I want to say with every ounce of intensity possible, if these are from God, you owe Him your most intense concentration. If these are not from God, it's merely somebody's advice. There's no point ratcheting it up in any sort of degree at all. It's, it's a zero-sum game. This is either from God, God's Word, God's promises, in which case the psalmist's repeated insistence that he loves these things and delights in them and meditates them on them day and night and finds in them an ability to answer his enemies and all the rest, it, it makes sense. It's, 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 it's obvious. And if it's not that, leave it aside. There's not much of a middle ground. That's the second thing to say about Psalm 139. Third thing, it's worth pausing for a moment to reflect on the psalmist's circumstances that are reflected in what he prays for. Let me mention two points. Number one, he lives in a culture that he finds essentially alien. He lives in a culture that is a long way removed from his own thinking. And number two, he's discouraged. Take a look at the first point. We'll look at a handful of verses. 126. 
It is time for you to act, Lord. Your law is being broken. So while the psalmist is enjoying the law of God, not many in his culture are enjoying it. He lives at a time of massive rebellion against God. Or back up to Psalm 95. The wicked are waiting to destroy me, but I will ponder your statutes. Just as there are forces in our culture that do like to see Christians tripped up in one fashion or another. Do you go all defensive or do you just turn again to the word of the Lord and ponder what he has disclosed? Verse 22, remove me from their scorn and contempt for I keep your statutes. Verse 69, Though the arrogant have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts with all my heart. So he's been the victim of a smear campaign of some sort or another. Or 23, though rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate on your decrees. Or verse 85, the arrogant dig pits to trap me contrary to your law. Or 87, they almost wiped me from the earth but I have not forsaken your precepts. That's how serious it was. He could have died from all of this. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, 109, I, have not, I will not forget your law. In other words, in our changing culture, we become aware of the fact that over the last 150 years, we've largely lost the Judeo-Christian heritage that nurtured North America for quite a long period of time. So it's possible to indulge in a kind of pity party. They're taking away my culture and I know not where they have laid it. <laughs> and then to lash out in anger and, and bitterness. But it really is important to get a bit of historical view and realize that sometimes godly people in the Old Testament were in the minority. It wasn't always times of revival, like the revival under the leadership of Josiah or another revival under the leadership of Nehemiah. It wasn't always like that. And in the New Testament itself, we find some remarkable passages. <clears throat> Do you recall when the apostles are first beaten up in Acts chapter 5, verse 41? The apostles rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. Isn't that spectacular? It took me a while to figure out just what that looked like. After all, they had seen remarkable success in those opening weeks and months. 3,000 converted on the day of Pentecost. Within a few weeks, another 5,000 men only, probably 20,000 people altogether. And held in high regard until finally in my mind's eye, Peter turns to John and says, John, are you sure we're doing this quite right? John says, what do you mean? Well, on the night that he was betrayed, Peter says, um, he insisted that if the people loved him, they would love us. And if the people hated him, they would hate us. But you know, we're having a blast. They crucified him and we're having fun. You know, it doesn't quite seem to correlate with what Jesus said. So John replies, well, you know, give me a break. It's revival time. It's special. You don't want to complain when God does give you revival, you know? Maybe there'll be persecution down the road, but right now it's revival. Yeah, but Peter says, J Jesus did say, you, you, you know, if, if, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. That's, that's, that's what he actually said. And then finally they get beaten up. <laughs> and Peter says, yes, it's about time. Do, do, do you see as the horizons become a little darker in Western civilization, this is not the time to have pity party. It's to reread Psalm 119. It's to reread Acts 5:41. Christians saying to one another, "Well, yes, it's about time." 
And what a privilege it is to suffer with the Lord Jesus. I'd rather have His statutes. I'd rather have His Word. I'd rather have His promises on my side. I, I, I love those things rather than the, than the particular forays of, of sexual and gender and identity and culture and value-less systems and everyone make his own identity. I, I, I'd rather have God's statutes than all of that. It's unstable. It's, unst it's temporary. It, 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 it's faddish. And if they pass laws that, that make it impossible for me to live agreeably, um, so, so be it. So he lives in an alien culture. And sometimes he's deeply discouraged. Look at 141. Though I am lowly and despised, I do not forget your precepts. Or 25. I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. Or 28, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Or 83, though I am like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your decrees. Or 136, Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. Here are tears caused not by his own loss or suffering, but because he is so empathetic with the word of God that where God's word is mocked or scorned, it causes him to cry. Like the Lord Jesus who can pronounce his woes on the city of Jerusalem in Matthew 23 but ends up at the end of the chapter weeping over the city. Or 53. Indignation grips me because of the wicked who have forsaken your law. And many more verses of the same sort. So, that's filling in the background. Number four, some of the powers of Scripture... How will Scripture function in the psalmist's life? How will it function in our lives? And then we'll talk about some of the further benefits of Scripture. So, the powers of Scripture, then the benefits of Scripture, and we're done with this first section. The powers of Scripture. Number one, the Scripture makes us rejoice in God. It fills us with delight. Verse 14, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. Verse 16, I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. And, and this is true not only of a scholar's stance, a scholar's pleasure in studying, as in Psalm, 90, Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day night, all, all, all day long. But it's also a simple disciple's stance. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. There are many, many, many texts that say similar things. The law from your mouth, verse 72, is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Do you believe that? You who are worried about your 401ks? Do you believe it as you consider what your children are going to do next? What's more precious to you, your summer chalet or the Word of God? What? Not, not just precious, but, but cherished and delighted in. Second, it calls forth love for Scripture. Let me just read a few verses. 47, I delight in your commands because I love them. 48, I reach out for your commands which I love that I may meditate on your decrees. 97, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. 113, I hate double-minded people, 
but I love your law. 119. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your statutes. Do you hear that? Because God is just and ultimately brings judgment on wicked people, I love His Word because of it. In other words, His Word doesn't trim corners or grade on the curve. It maintains justice, and therefore I love it. Hundred and twenty seven. Because I love your commands more than gold, more than pure gold, and because I consider all your precepts right, therefore I hate every wrong path. You either love the word of God or you love wickedness. One thirty two. Turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. 140. Your promises have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. 159. See how I love your precepts. Preserve my, Lord, my life, Lord, in accordance with your love. 163. I hate and detest falsehood, but I love your law. Isn't that a smashing contrast? 165, great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. It engenders stability, as we'll see in a few moments. So, Scripture makes us rejoice in God. It calls forth love for Scripture. And number three, it calls us to reverence, to awe, even to fear, because God is awesome as revealed in His Word. Listen to 120. My flesh trembles in fear of you. I stand in awe of your laws. You see, this is not written by someone who is engaging in some sort of neutral scholarly pursuit and says, oh, I have come to the considered conclusion that this is a pretty serious form of literature. <laughs> On the whole, I hold it in high regard. But it's the word of God. My flesh trembles in fear of you. I stand in awe of your laws. 161. Rulers persecute me without cause, but my heart trembles at your word. Do you hear the contrast? They persecute me, and I don't give a rip about that. What I really fear is your word. Or back in 38, fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. So these are some of the powers of Scripture. It is powerful to make us rejoice in God. It calls forth love for Scripture and for God. And it calls forth awe because God is Himself awesome as revealed in His Word. And finally, in this first section, some of the benefits of Scripture. Number one, Scripture brings deep, deep liberation. It brings deep, deep freedom. Listen to 45. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. You think, freedom? This sounds more like constraint. This sounds more like rules. This sounds more like law. And we're supposed to think that this gives us freedom? Well, press on. Not only verse 45, but uh, 32. I run in the path of your commands, for you have broadened my understanding. In other words, part of the freedom is that you've actually increased your grasp of reality increased your understanding of the world. You're no longer constrained by some narrow-mindedness. You've been brought up into a, a broad space. Look at verse 100. 
I have more understanding than, the, than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. You know, there's a passage in the New Testament that says something a bit similar. It's a passage we sometimes jump over just a bit too quickly. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, toward the end of the chapter. There the Apostle Paul is talking about the person with the Spirit and the person without the Spirit. The person who has the Spirit understands the things of God, not least the things of God in Scripture, and the person without the, the Spirit does not understand them. Do you see? So we read 2.14 of 1 Corinthians, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Then this, the person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. But what does that mean? Does this mean that Christians can go about without being judged by anybody? No, 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 no. No, we're, we're subject to the laws of the land. And in the local church, there's a a process of discipline. If people are going astray, we're supposed to admonish one another. And in the worst cases, we actually bring about excommunication. Somebody is put out because of persistent, dogmatic, unrepented of immorality or, or doctrine. Yes, yes, yes. There, there, there is judgment that takes place. But in the context of 1 Corinthians 2, do you see what is being said? <clears throat> the natural person, so-called, the person without the Spirit, doesn't understand the things of God. They're foolishness to them. But the person with the Spirit does understand them. And that means that he's got a horizon of understanding that is much broader. It is much bigger than the unregenerate person. But put yourself in the place of a pagan, a decent pagan bloke in first century Corinth. And you think like a pagan with your many gods and you believe that religion and morals are quite separate. And Maybe you've offered a sacrifice to Neptune recently because you're making a sea voyage. Or maybe you had to give a speech at work, so you offered a sacrifice to Hermes, the god of communication. And you know that all the gods and the goddesses, thousands of them in the Greek pantheon, they're sleeping around and they're jealous and they're angry. And they're, that's why ethics is not tied to religion in the pagan world. And then somewhere along the line, that, although that's the world you live in, and that's how you frame your thinking, and that's how you understand reality. Yet somewhere along the line, you become a Christian. The Spirit of God has come upon you, enabling you to understand the Bible. You understand what sin is, what God has done to forgive your sin, whom you have offended, what the cross was about, what the resurrection testifies to, that there is only one God, but He exists in three persons. Your whole worldview has changed. So how does your new worldview compare with the old one? Well, in the old one, the natural man doesn't understand the things of God. They're foolishness to him. This is all a pile of junk over here. But now you become a Christian. You understand this pagan worldview. That's where you were. But you understand a whole lot more because you've got the Spirit of God and you see where things really are. So actually, having the Word of God brought home to you forcefully by the Spirit of God, has broadened your understanding. You've got a bigger mind. You've got a larger capacity. You, you understand things more than your teachers do, your pagan teachers. Do you, do, do you see? This is not an insult saying that once you become a Christian or once you have the Spirit of God or because you read the Bible, therefore your IQ is better than your profs at the local university. It's not saying that. This is not a way towards arrogance. It's a way of saying your entire frame of reference changes under the Word of God. And as your word of God changes, you're liberated from the old enslavements, from the old ways of looking at things. Your horizons are broadened and deepened. You're driven to worship and reverence and awe and love and fear. So the Holy Scripture brings freedom and liberation. Number two, it brings life. 144. Your statutes are always righteous. Give me understanding that I may live. 154. 
Defend my cause and redeem me. Preserve my life according to your promise. 156. Your compassion, Lord, is great. Preserve my life according to your laws. 159. See how I love your precepts. Preserve my life, Lord, in accordance with your love. It brings life. For life is tied to God's promises. Many of the verses say that sort of thing. Sometimes the psalmist asks for life, and sometimes he speaks wanting his life to be preserved in integrity, in, in righteousness, in, in accordance with the law of God. In the New Testament, we're told that we are redeemed not by corruptible things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Christ. And then we're told that it's the Word of God in 1 Peter that engenders life within us as this Word of God communicates the gospel to us. Or again, number three, it brings light, sight, insight. Perhaps the best known verse in all of Psalm 119 is 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light on my, on my path. In other words, not only does it teach me certain things, it, it teaches me where to go. It illumines the path before me. It teaches me how to walk. In Hebrew thought, that's an ethical term, how to conduct myself. That's what the Word of God does. It puts a light on my path. Or again, it provides mental stability, verses 23 and 24. Listen to these remarkable verses. Though rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate on your decrees. Your statutes are my delight, they are my counselors. So, the powers of the age are ruled against you. You're slandered, you're despised. How do you cope with all of that? How do you know that you're right? Maybe you're just being obnoxious and ornery but you sink deeply into the Word of God and you become emotionally and mentally stable. <clears throat> Finally, the Word of God encourages us to persevere, verses 44 and 32. Now, I think for want of time, so that we allow extra time for discussion, I'm going to skip going through a couple of the units section by section so you see how some of them are put together more closely and come instead to a conclusion shaped in a couple of ways. One application for some of you who don't know Christ yet, and for whom this really is a bit much, it sounds a bit over the top and not very realistic, and some of you who are Christians, nevertheless, who would testify, if you were put in a corner, that you don't delight in the law of the Lord. Let's look at those two briefly. You'll remember that we looked at a number of passages which said that the Bible, the Word of God, the law of God, opens our minds so that we understand things that we would otherwise not understand. I run in the path of your commands, for you have broadened my understanding. Or what we saw in 97 and following. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. Let me tell you about a former student, 20 years or so ago at Trinity. Came from a bad background, barely squeaked out of high school. Somebody was stacking the books for him to get through it all. He tried to get into college, couldn't get in anywhere. Um, joined the military largely because he didn't have anything else to do and got into the drug scene in the army. Uh, somehow managed to, because he was physically robust, he got into the 82nd Airborne, but he was part of a group that was doing drugs. And um, he remembers jumping out of airplanes uh, when he was high on LSD. He used to carry a Gideon New Testament in his breast pocket, not because he ever read the thing, he just viewed it as a kind of talisman, a, a good luck charm. You jump out of airplanes with LSD in your veins, and believe me, you need some good luck charms. But one day he was bored somewhere and he started reading it. 
he, he found it hard to read. He, he wasn't much of a reader, but he started to read it, and gradually it took hold of him. Didn't understand it very well, but he felt himself sliding over to become some kind of believer. So he went to one of the chaplains and said, I, I think I've become a Christian. Well, wh why do you think that? Well, I've, I've been reading this Gideon New Testament, and I, I think I've become a Christian. Oh, no, that's, that's not the way it works. Uh, let, let me get you going on a catechism. And so he had about six months of that, and it wasn't going anywhere. And eventually, he found off base uh, an evangelical church that taught the Bible and nurtured him and discipled him. He came right off drugs, and six months after he got off drugs, the drug unit in the 82nd Airborne was busted. All kinds of guys were court-martialed. He finished his stint in the army, and somehow, because he had accrued enough respect as someone in the 82nd Airborne, he got into some college somewhere, and he began to blossom and grow. Small Christian college began to grow, began to blossom. And four years later, he graduated with top honors and came on to seminary, which is where I met him. And now he's in vocational ministry. So tell me, did the Word of God make him more narrow or expand his horizon? Did it enslave him, or did it liberate him? Did it make him less of a man, or did it fulfill him as a man? Do you see, that's what the Word of God does. So, so that if you're not a believer and you're, you're coming across these things for the first time, you must understand that Torah, the law of the Lord, instruction. The Word of God is going to introduce you to God's assessment of your sin. It's going to introduce you to the glory of God Himself. It's going to introduce you to Jesus Christ, the God-man, who bears our sin in His own body on the tree, the curse and the penalty and the death of it, so that His righteousness becomes ours as our sin becomes His. And all of this is received not because you're so smart or so bright or so clever or so gifted or so physical or so beautiful or so young or so anything, but because Christ loves sinners and this is received by faith. It demands repentance and faith. And on the other side, there is opened up an entire new vista as you bow before Him and say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. God, be merciful on me, a sinner. But I suspect that most people in this audience tonight are not in that position. Most are Christians. But all of us who are Christians have to confess that there are times where the Word of God doesn't mean all that much to us. Oh, at a certain theoretical level, we want to sign on that this is truly the Word of God. Fine, fine, fine. But I delight in your statutes, O Lord. I meditate on them day and night. We may have even given up having our devotion, squeeze some time into pulling on our, between pulling on our socks and sucking our orange juice before we beat it out the back door on the way to work, making sure we have time to check our iPhones. I want to come back to this one tomorrow. But I am sure of this that Christians cannot be serious Christians. You can't ultimately be sure if they're Christians at all unless there's some spark of delight in the living Word of God. Christ's sheep know His voice. And that demands dealing forcefully with secret sins, Jonathan Edwards wrote on the flyleaf of his Bible, either this book will keep me from sin or sin will keep me from this book. Let me tell you frankly, if you're watching a lot of porn, your devotional life's not going to be so hot.
It means adjusting your time priorities, time to think about the Word of God. Time to read the Bible, not because it's time for your devotions, but because you like it. I remember meeting a chap at university a long time ago who was quietly reading the Bible in the laundromat where we were both washing our clothes. And I said, um, what, what, what are you reading? Yeah, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm reading Amos. I knew he was studying the New Testament. I said, why are you reading Amos? He said, because I like it. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Do your kids ever come home from school and see you just sitting in the chair reading your Bible? Why are you reading your Bible, Dad? Because I like it. What kind of heritage is that for your kids? Did you, did you see? Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. What does hide in your heart mean? Do you know what it means? It means memorize it. I wonder how many in this august crowd have memorized one complete chapter of Scripture. Stick at one. Make it a short one. Psalm 1. <laughs> then go for a challenge. Romans 8. Did, did, did you see? Hiding God's Word. In you. If you're supposed to meditate on it day and night, how can you meditate on it day and night unless there's something in your mind to meditate on? Christian meditation is not like OM meditation where you're supposed to concentrate on a, a single dot in a white expanse and empty your brain of everything and think nothingness. <laughs> Christian meditation presupposes that you fill your mind with good things and then turn it over in your mind. It presupposes sharing it with others. It presupposes finding out how Scripture relates to all of life and delighting in it. A lot of specific questions about uh, tips for meditating. You did it at the end there, but one guy asked, when I work all day, how do I meditate? And, and then also a lot of people asking about, how do I develop that uh, joy? Nah. How do I love the word? Excellent. How do I muster up that emotion? Yep. Any tips there? Yep, for... yep, 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 yep. I'll say more about the meditation stuff tomorrow in one of the public sessions, so I will come back to that one. Um, I'll, I'll say this about it now. One of the one of the important things about uh, meditation is not that when you're working with a computer at work, uh, you have to keep one track of your mind open to contemplating the triune God or something like that. that that's not what it's meant. It, it, it's it's meant more along the lines of. This stuff is always so close to the top of your mind that any time it goes into neutral, that's what you think about. You come to a red light, what do you think about? You wake up in the middle of the night, what do you think about? And there are some people whose minds are so steeped in Scripture, they're, they're busy memorizing it, and they're, they're, they're sharing their faith with others. They're in evangelistic Bible studies and so on. That, that, it's just where their mind goes. Do, 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 do you see? Mm. Whereas if the only exposure you get to the Word of God is a sermon once a week, and no Bible reading at all, then the biblical content is nowhere close to the top of the mind. There's nothing to think about unless you actually sit down and say, I will now hereafter memorize something or other and meditate thereupon. Um, well, okay, but that's, that's sort of like force feeding. It becomes a habit once you, 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 you do it enough that it, it becomes second nature to you. That's what is meant by meditating day and night, rather than saying you're not allowed to think about any, anything else. You're, you're, you know, time to wash the, 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 the baby's face or change his diapers. Can't think about that. I'm busy meditating. You, it's, it's, it's nothing like that at all. But, but eventually this becomes so, so much the constraint for the way you see things that even the jobs that you're doing, you're consciously, unconsciously thinking of doing them as offering them up to God. Do you see? Doing, doing the changing of the baby, baby's diapers or turning tools on a lathe or prescribing medicines or as, as offering it up to God. It, it just changes the valuations everywhere. Um, C.S. Lewis somewhere says that the truthfulness of the Bible is not so much the light that one sees, but the light by which one sees everything else. Mm. Now, I'm, I'm not sure it's an either or. I think it's both and, but 
but that's very, that's very wise. Mm. Well, take that a little further. Some of us are in Bible studies maybe three or four nights a week, and that's a high, high emphasis on study in this church in particular, but you're advocating for more than that, this, this, this one-on-one time that's... Uh, I, I don't care whether it's one-on-one -on -one or one-on group time or something, mm -hmm. but somewhere along the line, it needs to be done in such a way that you're developing not merely a cerebral grasp of more Bible, mm -hmm. but delight in God. Yeah. It has to be studied in such a way, talked about and applied in such a way, that you come away delighting in God. You're, you, you're delighting it not the way an English scholar delights in studying Shakespeare or the Romantics, in the Lake District, but <coughs> delighting in it because this is God's Word and it discloses so much about Him that um, it's fantastic what I'm learning about God in my ability to fear Him and adore Him and respond to Him in faith and obedience and so on, renews my covenantal commitments. I know a chap, a pastor of a church a number of years ago, who fell into adultery do you know what pulled him out of it? Hmm. He, he kept reading the Word of God and stumbling across passages that talk about adultery. <laughs> so he took a concordance and looked every, up every passage that, passage that talked about adultery. He went and confessed his sin, resigned from his ministry and so on. What, what, what was it that did that? Did that? Mm -hmm. It wasn't that somebody caught him, exposed him. The Lord. It, was, it was the Bible. It, it was the Bible. And um, to, to, to delight in holiness because the Bible depicts holiness, to delight in truth because the Bible reveals the truth, to, divide, to delight in Jesus because He's the very truth incarnate is, is part of learning to handle the Bible well. But I will say a bit more about that tomorrow too. Cool. Great. Uh, so, a couple other questions. Uh, one person asks, uh, do you find a New Testament parallel to this emphasis in Psalm 119 on the importance of keeping God's laws and the promise of blessing if we do so? Second part, is, is the reason we find it in the Old Testament more, is it because they were under law, whereas we're under grace? Well, don't forget what I said about what Torah, law, means. It means, first of all, instruction. Whereas the question, the first part of it, really presupposes... Um, not so much instruction, but demand. But I would argue that the new covenant makes many demands. It demands that we repent. It demands that we love one another. It demands that we rear our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It demands that we give sacrificially. It demands that we evangelize. It demands that we live holy lives. And so it makes many, many, many demands. The difference is that as a whole covenantal structure, what is central to the Mosaic law, the Mosaic command, the Mosaic instruction, is that it is a sacrificial system that teaches you much about God and His ways and looks forward to what is coming, but it does not have intrinsic power to transform. So that when you move to grace, it does not mean grace but no demand. It means that under the terms of the new covenant, you're fulfilling all of the patterns and predictions of the old, but with power to transform. There's a there's an old Puritan poem. It's old English, but it runs something like this. Um, the law says do, and I commands. I in the sense of always commands. The law says do, and I commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. But better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly, then gives me wings. So the contrast between law and grace is not exactly between have to obey a bunch of rules over here and there's no grace anywhere. Right. And over here, there's lots of grace. You don't have to obey anything to anybody. You know, some people's favorite hymn is freed from the law of blessed condition. Um, and that, that's the only line they know. <laughs> whereas, whereas, of course, there's demand. Uh, there's demand that we be increasingly conformed to the likeness of God's own Son and so on. But it's all surrounded by the power of the Spirit of God and a regenerated nature and, 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 and so on, so on, so on. All in... in, in, in in anticipation of the consummation still to come. That's good. Um, another one, someone asks that you mentioned that it's our task to bring along those who are culturally far away. Can you elaborate on how reading and learning the word deeply helps us become better at effectively drawing those who are far away? Yeah, 
Good question. One could give a whole talk on that one just yeah. to, 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 uh, to, to introduce the subject. You, you see, the dangers are being so with it on the one hand that we can communicate with almost anybody, but having very little biblical content. So p people are having identity problems. Let me bring you to Jesus. He'll give you a proper identity. Or, or, or people are having uh, loneliness feelings in the city. Um, come, come to Jesus. He'll be your friend. So, so that all that we pitch in the gospel is pitched in terms of the felt need of the moment. But if that's all that we do, then ultimately we're not teaching them what the Bible says, the categories the Bible uses, or, 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 or the structures of its thinking. And so we're not teaching them how to read the Bible intelligently. When they open the Bible after hearing about how they've got a new identity in Jesus, uh, they find instead that it's talking about blood sacrifice and a temple and, and covenant and th things like that, that, that that haven't been mentioned in our presentation of the Bible. So that in thoughtful, long-term, careful evangelism, including evangelistic Bible studies and, and the like, we do need to understand something of the culture. We need to know how to grapple with it and so on. But even more fundamentally, we need to know 